In these videos, we will review section 2.2, which covered some of the rules of inference in propositional logic, and I'll also provide some extra commentary, which hopefully will be helpful, hopefully useful. Remember that a proof always begins with some premises, and these premises are simply given sentences, which in mathematical logic can either be atomic or molecular. They declare something to be the case. They are truth functional. These sentences can also be called propositions. So a proof starts with given propositions that are simply taken for granted. We then, through inference, or multiple inferences, attempt to prove or derive new additional sentences, or propositions, or that is to say, a conclusion, or multiple conclusions. We can also call a proof an argument. And here we're of course using the term argument the same way a logician or philosopher uses that term. So we shouldn't just think of two people bickering back and forth in some heated debate. Indeed, Robinson Crusoe, alone on a deserted island, can engage in argumentation. He can prove things by himself, to himself, without another person. An argument is simply where a proposition or set of propositions are being justified with evidence. And this, of course, is what a proof is doing. Moreover, it doesn't just make assertions. Rather, it is giving evidence. Oftentimes, when we're watching these politicians on television or YouTube, they aren't making arguments at all. Instead, they're just making assertions or emoting their feelings over numerous complex issues. At any rate, a proof takes given propositions, premises, and then it tries to pull out of those premises through various rules of inference to derive new sentences, new propositions, to reach some conclusions. It's in this sense that logic can extend our knowledge. Now, I'm pretty sure, by the way, that the most famous argument in all of logic is all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. We haven't covered that type of argument yet. That requires predicate logic or Aristotelian scholastic logic. Nevertheless, propositional logic is a powerful tool. It allows us to relate different propositions through the so-called sentential connectives, such as and, or, not, if, then, if, and only if. Section 2.2 starts with what scholastic logic calls the mixed hypothetical syllogism. And there are only two valid forms, modus ponens and modus tollens. The other two are invalid. This is a good place to start. It has the same major premise, if p then q. We have a molecular sentence. If p is the case, then q is the case. Notice that nothing is being affirmed or denied here. We're not told that p in fact is the case. Also, we're not told that p is not the case. And likewise, we're not told that q is the case or that it is not the case. We're only told that if p is the case, then q is the case. Now p, we call the antecedent, and q, we call the consequent. where p, the antecedent, is sufficient for q, the consequent. p is sufficient for q, however, it's not necessary for q. In other words, so to speak, other things might bring about or cause q. p is sufficient for q, it is not necessary for q. The first major rule of inference is modus ponens or MP for short. The first premise is if P then Q. The second premise affirms that antecedent. P is the case. So what can we get from that? Those three dots mean therefore. Well, we know the antecedent is sufficient for the consequent. P is the case. So we could affirm that antecedent to affirm that consequent to get Q. For example, if it's raining, then it's cloudy. It is raining, thus it's cloudy. The antecedent is sufficient for the consequent. Since P is the case, Q is the case. Like I said, though P is sufficient for Q, it's not necessary for Q. However, Q, the consequent, is absolutely necessary for the antecedent P. Let's look at modus tollens then. Or MT for short. We have the first premise, if P then Q. The second premise denies the consequent. Q is not the case, so what can we get there? Therefore what? Well, since the consequent is necessary for the antecedent, 
and we know that q is not the case, we can deny the antecedent. p must not be the case, so not p. That makes sense. If q is not the case, there's no way p can be the case. Moreover, if you think about it, if p were the case, we would be back at a modus ponens inference, and q would be the case. But once again, we know by premise 2 that q is not the case, so p cannot be the case. For example, if it's raining, then it's cloudy. It's not cloudy, thus it's not raining. The consequent is necessary for the antecedent. Indeed, the distinction between sufficient and necessary conditions, in my mind, is at the heart of understanding the mixed hypothetical syllogism. And if we confuse sufficient and necessary conditions, we can easily run into two formal fallacies, the fallacy of affirming the consequent and the fallacy of denying the antecedent. Here's what happens when we confuse sufficient and necessary conditions. One fallacy is the fallacy of affirming the consequent. Let's say someone makes the argument, first premise, if p, then q, second premise, q, and then they say, well, because we know q is the case, well, it must be that p, so to speak, brought it about. p must be the case. But again, this is invalid. Why is it invalid? Because we're confusing sufficient and necessary conditions. The antecedent is only sufficient for the consequent. It's not necessary. But this is treating the antecedent as if it were necessary, but it's not. For example, if it's raining, then it's cloudy. It's cloudy, thus it's raining. Clearly, something went wrong there. Just because it's cloudy, we cannot infer that it's raining. We have the fallacy of affirming the consequent. And then we have the fallacy of denying the antecedent. First premise, if p, then q. Second premise, not p. And then, what if we said, because p is not the case, q must not be the case. It's really the same basic mistake that's happening. We're confusing sufficient and necessary conditions. This is invalid. It's treating the antecedent as necessary, but it's not necessary. For example, if it's raining, then it's cloudy. It's not raining, thus it's not cloudy. Using our intuition, our common sense, we can see that that is clearly fallacious. Just because it's not raining, that doesn't mean it's not cloudy. And so, once we understand sufficient necessary conditions, we understand why we have the fallacy of affirming the consequent, we understand the fallacy of denying the antecedent, but we also understand why modus tollens and modus ponens are valid inferences.